and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top-selling Spectrum games from May 1987. We compare centipede clones in a mammoth arcade shootout. I review some older games. Check out a newer title. Jeff is back with more mods. And there's a quick review of the Ram Turbo. But first, it's the news. Codemasters and Activision are embroiled in a tussle about the budget game Grand Prix Simulator. The game released by the UK software house, according to Activision, bears a striking resemblance to their game Super Sprint. So much so that the American giant has threatened legal action if the game is not withdrawn. Codemasters so far have refused to be bullied, saying the only similarity is that they are both top-down racers. Other than that, there is nothing that can be said to have been copied. The lawyers have stepped in now and are arguing through the matter until they have earned enough money to buy a new Aston Martin. Each. It seems to be a recurring problem for Sinclair, with most, if not all, of their hardware having some sort of delay, and the Z88 will follow in that trend. This time Clive Sinclair claims the delay is being caused by last minute software problems. He says that they have all the individual components and they now need to be put together so that they can be added to the machine. Units are now not expected until mid-May, but that hasn't stopped the Advertising Standards Authority from firing warning shots at Sinclair for not having the release date on mail-order adverts. With the buyout of Melbourne House by Mastertronic, the much-advertised game Inspector Gadget and the Circus of Fear has been shelved. The game, which was almost complete, with even review copies being sent out, was not, according to Mastertronic, good enough to be sold. The game was written by Beam Software, and was based on the kids' cartoon, but it seems even the authors agree with the decision, stating that Mastertronic's choice was a fair decision. All is not lost, however, as Beam still hold the license and plan to make a new game. Amstrad's latest and much-hyped new Spectrum, the Plus 3, will be available to buy in July, so claim the manufacturers. The new machine is based on the previous Plus 2 model, but will replace the tape deck with a 3-inch disk drive. It will come with six free games, including Gift from the Gods, Cosmic War Toad, and Daily Thompson's Super Test. The asking price is said to be higher than anticipated, costing £249. Locomotive Software have also confirmed that its operating system, CPM, will be available for the machine at release. The company wrote the disk operating system for the new Spectrum and added in compatibility for Amstrad disks. They will also be supplying Mallard Basic to run on CPM. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the chart this month are Enduro Racer, the great motorbike racing game from Activision, Avida Zane Monty, the platform game from Gremlin Graphics, Arknoid, the arcade conversion from Ocean Software. Nemesis, another arcade conversion, this time from Konami. And Escape from Sinji's Castle, the follow-up to Dragon's Lair from Software Projects. And that was the news and top-selling games from May 1987. Centipede was released into the arcades in 1980 by Atari. It took the standard vertical shooting game and gave it a new twist. You are an archer, or a gnome, or an elf, depending on the version and hardware you're playing on, and your role is to shoot a centipede. The aforementioned beast moves from the top of the screen to the bottom, moving horizontally as it goes. If it hits the side of the screen or a mushroom, it will change direction and each of its segments can be shot by the player. Other things to avoid include a spider that bounces around the screen, a flea that drops vertically straight down leaving mushrooms in its path, and a scorpion. The player does have limited movement vertically, but only a few lines up and down to get out of trouble when the centipede reaches the bottom of the screen. A simple idea, 
and a great game, even better when played using the original arcade trackball. The follow-up, Millipede, introduced many new enemies, so when choosing which games to test, I tried to make sure they were all centipede clones, even if they were called Millipede, or variations thereof. So, how did the Spectrum clones stand up? First we have Bug Blaster, produced by Crystal Computing in 1983. Crystal made changes to the base game with this release, which is a bit of a shame really, because the original was great. Here we get weeds instead of mushrooms, and single bugs instead of the multi-segmented centipede, and also a fly that takes the place of the spider. The pace of the game is great and provides a good challenge. The graphics are small, but move well, and sound is really nice. A good game to start with then, it's just a pity that it moves away from the arcade format. Next we have Caterpillar from Spectrum Games, released in 1983. This game sticks to the arcade format. The centipede moves well and splits when shot. The mushrooms are replaced by red blobs when you shoot them, and there's a spider. But it looks more like a fast food logo, than something to be scared of. The action is fast, but the firing rate is a bit slow, making for a sometimes frustrating game. Sound is used well, with some nice effects. I sometimes got confused during play. The screen flashed white, but I don't know if I had just been killed, or got a bonus. It was difficult to tell. There's no flea or scorpion, just a spider, but despite this, the game plays quite well. Next we have another game called Caterpillar, this time from CDS, released in 1983. This version includes all the arcade features, which obviously makes for a high scoring game. Then things start to go wrong. The graphics, although looking nice, move slowly in character based jumps, and the firing rate is way too slow. The sound is very basic, and overall, it was a game I felt I didn't want to go back to. A real shame then, because it's the only one so far that has the full feature set. Next we have a game called Centipede, from DK Tronics, released in 1982. This version is the one that I bought, and it plays quite well. It has the splitting centipede, the mushrooms, and the spider. It doesn't, however, have the flea or scorpion, at least after the three or four levels I managed to get to. The graphics are small but move well, and control is responsive. The sound is well used, with some nice effects. When the centipede reaches the bottom of the screen, it goes back straight up to the top, unlike the arcade, which only jumps back up a few lines. This can sometimes mean you have to wait for the end segments to get a bit lower before you can actually complete the level. fast paced game then, but it doesn't contain all the arcade elements. Another game called Centipede, this time released by Vectris Software in 1983. Oh dear, this is a slow bad version of the game. A white background, slow jerky graphics, bad sound, no vertical movement, and yes you've guessed it, it's written in basic. Let's move on. The next game is Centipedes, from EMM Software, released in 1983. This starts off looking promising. The game speed is selectable and works well. The graphics are nice, with some great explosions, but there's no sound, until you die. The control works well, although the keys are a bit tricky to get used to. There's a large spider, but as far as I can see, no flea or scorpion. It's a pity about the sound, really, 
because this is a decent game to play and has great presentation. Moving on and we have Centropods, released by Rabbit Software in 1983. This version gives us most of the arcade elements, and plays quite well. The graphics are nicely drawn and move well, the spider is there, and so is the flea. The sound is a bit bland though, using just basic beeps. Vertical movement is done by holding the left and right keys down at the same time, and the player moves up, releasing the keys and the player floats back down again. Very awkward. Not a bad version then. Moving on, and the next game is Creepy Crawler. Released by Microgen in 1983. Ah, those wonderful Microgen sounds. This game has most of the arcade elements, but why the white background? The screen does change colour each level, but it should really just stay black. The graphics look nice and move well. The spider is there, and the flea makes an appearance as well. The sound consists of those familiar microgen sounds and work with the game quite well. The control is good, with far directional movement, and gameplay provides a good challenge. Not a bad version then, but the colours are still a bit off-putting. The next game is Cyber Rats from Silversoft, released in 1982. This game breaks away from the arcade, with multiple single targets instead of the segmented centipede. The rats are small, bland and moving character based jumps. But having said that, the gameplay provides a good challenge. And it's the only game so far that actually changes the colour of the mushrooms for each level. There's no spider, but the flea does make an appearance now and again. Sound is used well with some nice sound effects that really suit the game. Gameplay, as I've said before, is good, and I enjoyed this. The multiple segments make for a different challenge, and it's worth giving this game a play. Next we have Megapede from Softech, released in 1983. This game contains most of the arcade elements, although some of them are swapped out. For example, there's no scorpion, but something that looks like a ghost, that moves across the screen, dropping things down. The spider is present, as is the multi-segmented centipede. The graphics are clear, but basic, and move in character-based jumps, although this doesn't affect the gameplay. The action is fast, and you get a good choice of game speeds. Sound is used well, although the standard beep is used for certain things, which is a bit of a shame really, considering some of the other effects that's been used. The mushrooms take more than one hit to get rid of, and overall it's not a bad game once you get used to the tricky control keys. Softech also released this game as Millipede. Same game, different name. Moving on, and this is Millimon from Arctic Computing, released in 1983. The screen aspect has been changed by adding a side panel, which is not a bad idea, but then why would you have the main area as white? It looks terrible. The graphics are bland and move in character based jumps, and the control is a bit sluggish. Sound is not bad with some decent effects, but all the elements of the arcade are not here. No flea or scorpion. A bit of a letdown then from Arctic. 
and not as playable as some of the other games. Next we have Millipede from Add-on Electronics in 1984. The game starts as soon as it's finished loading, and straight away the annoying loud beeping sound begins to irritate. Bland graphics move quite fast, but the firing rate does not match them, meaning the game is too tricky to get very far. Before you've had 10 shots, the centipede's at the bottom of the screen. There's a spider hopping about, and a scorpion, but I never saw the flea. The spider's a real pain, and often jumps straight into you, giving you no chance to move. Not a bad game, but not the best on offer. Next is Mushroom Alley, by Mogul Communications, released in 1984. This game has a nice presentation, but moves away from the arcade format. There's a centipede moving down the screen, but also boxes of TNT. Hitting these by accident will cause you to lose a life. There's a snail that moves across the screen, adding more mushrooms. And the attract mode does show spiders and fleas, but I never got that far to see them. The graphics are nice and move smoothly, and control is definable and responsive. The mushrooms take more than one hit to remove, and the game plays really well. The main problem is the firing rate, as with many other games. It's just too slow for a game that runs at this pace. A bit of a shame, as I quite like this version. The centipede also goes back up to the top of the screen though, instead of mimicking the arcade machine. And now on to Mushroom Mania, released by Arcadia in 1988. This is the newest of the centipedes tested, so you'd have thought it would be technically better. All hail the default death sound. Things start with a beeper tune, which doesn't raise hopes. There's a centipede, a spider, but the flea is replaced by, I think, a fox head. And there's also a Pac-Man in there. The game tries hard, but falls short, in my opinion. There are too many mushrooms ensuring the centipede always reaches the bottom of the screen, and that Pac-Man is just annoying. A fast and furious game then, but the skill is replaced by holding the fire button and just avoiding things. Which is not what Centipede's about, really. Next we have Night Stalker from Thor Computing, released in 1984. Another promising looking game, with the arcade elements all there. Apart from the Centipede going back to the top of the screen. Graphics are nicely drawn and move well, and you are given a choice of difficulty settings. But even on easy, this game is a challenge due to the amount of things happening at once. On the first screen, you encounter spiders, up to three fleas, and a scorpion, and of course the centipede itself. The action certainly hots up, and the gameplay is enjoyable, if a little difficult. I like this version. It's certainly a contender. Next up is Rapides from Visions, released in 1983. This looks familiar. It is in fact the same game as Centipedes from EMM Software, but with added sound and more Centipede segments. There's also a flea that drops down the screen. We now get a firing sound, but sadly nothing else, apart from a death sound. Gameplay is okay, but the firing rate should have been much faster. The firing sound plays based on the distance your shot gets from you, so it can be cut short, or, if a mushroom is directly above you, not play at all, which makes for a little bit of an odd experience. More sound and faster firing would certainly improve this game.
Next we have Scorpion from Livewire Software, released in 1983. Hold on a minute, this is a copy of Caterpillar, the game by Spectrum Games. Or was it that this one was released first? I guess we'll never know, but it's certainly the same game. The font is different, and so are the centipede segments, but everything else is identical, even the key layout and sound effects. This is a scorpion. And this is caterpillar. They are credited to different authors, but come on, really? Next is Spectipede, released by R&R Software in 1983. The first thing I noticed about this game was the multicoloured sprite on the intro screen. Very nice. On to the game then, and we get all the arcade elements. The graphics are nice and move smoothly, and there's certainly a lot going on on screen. Sound is used very well with some nice effects. The centipede does not make a sound though, but you are fooled into thinking it does because of the firing sound. Control is good, and it certainly needs to be for this challenging game. The mushrooms change colour on each level too, and there's nothing bad I could really find with this game, apart from maybe the difficulty. It's harder than the arcade, but does that make it a bad game? Next is Spectropede from Protech, released in 1983. This game is quite decent too, once you get used to it. Most of the arcade elements are present, although I never saw the flea. I did see a space invader though. The graphics are a bit basic, but do the job, and sound is used well. The game does get faster as the centipede gets closer to the bottom of the screen, and you just find yourself holding down the fire button and trying to avoid everything else. Not a bad game then, but the spider really starts to annoy you after a while. Next is Squirmy Wormy, by John Prince, released in 1983. This game gets playability spot on, and I find myself wanting to keep going back and trying to get further. The graphics are a bit bland, but do the job. Sound is used very well, with plenty of different effects on offer. Spider is present, and the scorpion, but I never saw the flea sadly. The centipede does go back to the top of the screen again, but I suppose I can forgive it because the gameplay is really good. The firing rate is just right, matching the game speed, and it gives you a really nice playing experience. A great game then, and one to consider. And lastly, yes we've finally reached the end, we have Super Centipede, released by Ctech in 1983. Ctech brought us the terrible Missile Command and the downright disgraceful Crazy Kong. So how did they do with this one? You do have to sit through this, you can't get away unfortunately. And then the game loads. Well it's not as bad as Crazy Kong. The graphics are rubbish and the sound is straight out of Crazy Kong. Control at least works though in this game. And there is actually a bit of a game in there. The spider is too aggressive, killing you almost every time. And as expected, it's far from being a competent game, let alone a competent version of the arcade game. That's it, that's the end of this mammoth shootout. I can't remember all the games I've played now. They all looked very similar. 
so I will be judging them on two aspects. Firstly, how close they were to the arcade, and secondly, on playability. So, if you want something close to the arcade, with all of the elements in place, then the game for you is Spectipede by r, r Software. If you're looking for playability, and don't really mind moving away from the arcade a little bit, then Squirmy Wormy is very playable, and definitely worth a shot. Honourable mentions go to Cyber Rats and Night Stalker. This is Nightmare Rally, released by Ocean Software in 1986. If you are a fan of rallying, then this game should need no introductions. However, there are a few twists that make it unique. As with the real thing, the objective is to drive through each stage in the shortest possible time, avoiding obstacles that slow you down. There are also pickups that give you super turbo power or allow you to teleport to any point. There are different surfaces to contend with as well, such as ice, where braking is useless and skidding is expected. Each stage is laid out using flags that you have to stay between if you want to complete the course in a good time. Sometimes the flags are quite close together, others very wide apart, allowing you the distance to swerve to mist trees and rocks that causes your car to jump onto two wheels for some reason. There are also rivers, and to cross these you have to slow down, otherwise it's curtains for your car. There are also fuel pickup points, and cones to hit for extra points. Revving your engine too much will cause it to overheat, and then the car slows down to allow it to cool off, so you have to be careful. You have the choice of manual or automatic gears, and I preferred the automatic, but it didn't make me any better at this game. as you can see are really nice, although the landscape is a bit flat and boring. The car is well drawn and animates well when you move, spin or jump. Sound on the other hand is a bit dull, with just the engine sounds and a beep when you hit something. The control is good, giving you a feeling that you have at least some control of the vehicle. It's a good game to play, especially if you like driving games, but because the stages are, to be frank, boring, the appeal can soon wane. This is SOS, released by Mastertronic in 1986. Mission 201 crashes on a faraway planet, and to signal for help, your only working droid is sent out in search of the missing radio. There is a ruined city to explore, and of course various things that will destroy your little droid. You can pick things up that will help you, such as computer disks, and these can be used to get past the large computers that block the way. You'll also need to find something that produces light, because slowly, as you play, night arrives, and this means you can't see a damn thing. This is the biggest issue I have with the game. Until you find a light, which I never managed to do, the game will be pretty short. You can't move around when it's dark, at least and survive, so you have to sit still which means that other robots that are wandering about will walk straight into you and kill you. I enjoyed this game far more when I used the poke to give constant daylight. Then the game became more of a puzzle-solving expedition, which was great. You also have to watch your energy and collect energy packs when required. The graphics are isometric, but move differently to other games of this style. The droid moves in sort of short hops for each key press, which takes a bit of getting used to. Control is easy, and it needs to be, although sometimes I often felt that I'd pressed a key and nothing happened, and this caused the little robot to jump straight off the platform and die.
The other problem is the screen layout. You don't know what's on the next screen, so taking a jump from a platform is like jumping into the unknown. Sound is limited to just beeps when you turn, or collect anything, and it would have been nice to have a sort of click sound when you stepped forward. Otherwise, there are long periods of silence when you're moving about. The control method is rotate left and right, jump and action. This works quite well, but it's certainly not designed for fast navigation, because as mentioned before, some of the keys seem not to register. Overall in a nice idea, but the daytime limit can be a bit vexing. The off-screen death can also sometimes be annoying, as can the sticky controls. If you can get over this and like isometric games, then certainly give this one a try. Otherwise I'd steer well clear and look at another alternative. This is Blackstar, from Usebox.net, released in 2015. You can't beat a good game of Space Invaders, and Blackstar certainly delivers. Armies of aliens stomp across the screen, just waiting to be blasted. And as each one is destroyed, the rest get faster, and you have to be accurate to clear them all before they get too close. The graphics are excellent, well drawn and animated, and they move really smoothly. Sound is used well, and the control is crisp. As each wave is cleared, a new wave appears, in a different formation, getting more and more aggressive. And all of this makes for a great game, and one to seek out if you're a fan of arcade shooters, in particular Space Invaders. Highly recommended. Go and grab a copy now. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at Terry the Turtle Vector Edition. So in the last few of these videos we've looked at one of the first Jet Set Willy mods and then a oldish Jet Set Willy mod by somebody who really was highly instrumental in the early Jet Set Willy mod scene. Today we're going completely different and what I've done is I've chosen quite a modern game, Terry the Turtle was released in 2013 which just does something completely different. The first thing you notice about Terry the Turtle is you're no longer Willy, you're a turtle. Terry the Turtle. This isn't unprecedented in Jet Set Willy mods. In Jet Set Willy mods there's quite a few of the games where you actually play as someone other than Willy. And even quite a few where you play as a animal. You can play as a bat, you can play as a cat, you can play as various other animals. Now the next big thing to hit you is that this is a completely different game to Jet Set Willy. If it wasn't for the fact that this is marked as a Jet Set Willy mod, you could be forgiven for thinking this is just a different game. All of the graphics have been changed, all of the maps have been changed, basically everything's been changed. The story behind the game is that Terry was a turtle that's woken up on a beach, hatched out, and there's been a hurricane, so the beach is much, much, much more dangerous than it usually would be, and you've got to find your way to the sea, rescuing all your turtle brethren as you go. Now another change to Jet Set Willy that I really like about this game is that every time you pick up an object, you get an extra life. And believe me, you need them in this game. It isn't an easy game. But it's not overly hard, it's not relentlessly hard. As I said, some of the Jet Set Willy mods out there are really, really difficult from the get-go and never seem to get give up. You seem to have to fight for every inch, which isn't an enjoyable experience as far as I'm concerned. Now, another thing I really like about this game is it puts something into Jet Set Willy or a Jet Set Willy mod that wasn't there in the original. And that is the collapsing flaws from Manic Miner. I remember when I first played Jet Set Willy thinking, What's happened to the collapsing floors? Why isn't there any collapsing floor? That was one of the best things about Manic Miner. And this game puts it back and puts it back right from the offset. 
and I really enjoy playing it. I really enjoy playing games with collapsing floor. I loved rooms like the vat and the warehouse in the original Manny Miner. That collapsing floor felt like it was missing from the original Jet Set Willy, so it's really good to see it back here. Now, there isn't a map of this game on the World of Spectrum website. If anyone wants to make one and upload it, please feel free. It does feel quite linear. There aren't a lot of branches in this game when you play it, which again is something that quite a few of the mods do, and I like. It's nice to think, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm on a, a journey rather than an exploration and having to find rooms all over the place. That's not to say that there aren't different areas to explore, and there's some nice touches in this game. I do really like the tributes to the old Vector games, so in there you'll find a tribute to Asteroids and you'll find a tribute to Lunar Lander as well. There are probably more, but that's as far as I've managed to explore so far. Another change from the original Jet Set Willy game engine that I find very, very welcome is that you can fall as far as you want. And I guess that's in keeping with the laws of physics, in that I remember reading somewhere a long time ago that the impact you feel when you fall is proportional to the square of your weight. So if you think about it, a newly hatched turtle is a pretty light thing, and also they're almost parachute shaped, so they should be able to fall quite a long way before dying, especially if they're falling onto soft sand. Well, that's nice to see. Sometimes in Jet Set Willy I think, I wish I could just fall that little bit further. If I could fall a few pixels further, these rooms would be so much easier. This game's no walkover, so having the ability to fall as far as you want is a big boon. There is a non-Vector version of this game. I chose the Vector version again because it was something a bit different, and when I played the non-Vector version and the Vector version, I really liked the Vector version because it just looks so vibrant and is reminiscent of those old Vector games, particularly the colour ones, e.g. Star Wars. I'm thinking about it now, actually, there is a tribute to Star Wars in the game as well. When you first get onto the beach, there is an area with a moon in the sky that looks like the Death Star, and the title of the screen is That's No Moon, which is, of course, a classic quote from the original Star Wars movie. On the World of Spectrum website, this game is credited to Jammer Up, who, if you click through, is then credited to a guy called Steve Dixon. So, thank you, Steve, for writing this game. I really, really like this. Steve also wrote the aforementioned bat mod that I mentioned, where you can be a bat called Pip the Pipistrel. It's well worth checking out that game as well. That's a really, really good game. But as I said, I'm only including one game from any one author in this list. So that's Terry the Turtle, the Vector Edition. Well worth seeking out if you're a lover of Jet Set Willy mods and want something in particular. Well worth seeking out if you missed the collapsing floor from Manic Miner. I know I did. So until next time, happy gaming! Month's 16k game is Centipede from DKtronics. Only joking, although it is a game by the same company, 3D Tanks. For me, this was one of the better 16k games, and will probably be known by many Spectrum gamers, especially those who got their machines early on. The idea is simple, stop the tanks from getting across the bridge. To do this, you have your own tank, and you control the gun turret. You can move left and right, and raise or lower the gun. As enemy tanks appear, you have to judge your shot to either disable the tank or take it out completely. You will soon learn that certain elevations of your gun will hit one of the four rows on the bridge, and the game then becomes much easier. You also have limited ammo, with replenishments arriving at intervals. The tanks can fire back too, so you have to be careful, and if you take one straight down the barrel, it's game over. If you hit a tank with a certain elevation, this disables the tank but still allows it to fire back, and tanks soon begin to queue up behind it, and if you leave them long enough, they will destroy the tank themselves so that they can continue on their journey. 
this is a great little pick up and play game and will be a favourite for many players. The graphics are clean and well drawn, the 3D effect is good and sound works really well. Great playability too and certainly worth a blast. There were a few ROM interfaces for the Spectrum and I covered this subject in episode 21, but at that point I only had Sinclair's Interface 2 and I recently got hold of the other popular device, the RAM Turbo. It's slightly larger than Sinclair's offering, with stylish fins along the top that, although look nice, are a massive dirt magnet. The interface has a pass-through port and the second version of the model also added a reset switch. The joystick ports, of which there are two, outdo Sinclair by offering Kempston compatibility, which it detects automatically. Once plugged in, it operates in the same way as the other ROM units. You pop open the flap, insert the cartridge of your choice, power on the Spectrum and play. There's not a lot to add other than that really. It does what it was designed to do and by offering a Kempston option and reset switch had more features than the others. What no ROM interface had though, which is odd, is a power switch. You had to turn off the power to swap cartridges, so why not just add a simple toggle switch? RAM did add a safety feature though, a small plastic loop that stops you plugging in or unplugging the interface while the power is on. Not a bad idea, and they used that on several other of their interfaces. So, it's a ROM interface. Um, yep, that about covers it. And it gives me an excuse to play some classic games. <laughs>